My name is Chanel Johnson. I'm the first full-time Black and Minorities Ethnic Students Officer. I'm proud to present our Black History Lecture Series. Robin Walker speaks about Africans' contribution to science and technology. Today I'll be presenting research from my book Blacks and Science Volume 3. Now, while browsing the internet, I came across an article that mentioned the following information. The article said, Thomas Jennings was the first African American to receive a patent on March the 3rd, 1821, US Patent 3306X. Thomas Jennings's patent was for a dry cleaning process called dry scouring. Okay, so what's a patent? A patent is a bit like a copyright but it's for a scientific process, an invention, or a chemical compound. Now, while reading this, a number of thoughts came to me. An African-American inventor in 1821, is this an exception, or are there other examples? Now, after doing more research, I can now pose the question to you. Did you know that a camera invented by a black astrophysicist was used during the Apollo 16 space mission to collect ultraviolet images photographed from the moon. That astrophysicist was, of course, Dr. George Carruthers. In fact, do you know any of the following facts? An early 18th century Virginia slave developed effective treatments against skin and venereal disease. In fact, and I'm quoting now, his work was so outstanding that in 1729, the Virginia legislature bought him from his owner, thus freeing him from slavery to practice medicine exclusively. Another one. Astronomical works by a late 18th century black mathematician and astronomer were widely read and, quote, became a household staple in early America along with the Bible. Third example. A 19th century African-American blacksmith patented an invention described as, quote, the most important single invention in the whole history of whaling. Fourth example, a 19th century inventor of black South American heritage created such a revolution in the shoe industry that it was said of him, what Edison is to artificial lighting, he is to footwear. By 1913, African Americans are estimated to have held around 1,000 patents for various inventions in household goods, industrial machinery, transportation, electricity, and chemical compounds. Moreover, a black physicist extended the quantum theory in the 1920s. Henry Ford described a black botanist in the 1930s as the greatest living scientist. Another black chemist invented synthetic cortisone, which is an effective treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, that broke the monopoly that European chemists had on the production of sterols. Twelve black scientists and mathematicians worked on the Manhattan Project, i.e. the American nuclear bomb project during World War II. A black surgeon headed the blood bank system of the US and the UK during World War II. And finally, the research of a black physicist and inventor of the 1960s generation may hold a key to addressing the main concerns of our times. Dwindling sources of usable energy, rising energy costs, and increasing demand for energy. Now, what I'm going to talk about in today's presentation is this. I'm going to talk about some of the early African-American pioneers of science and invention, taking the story up to 1913. For the rest of the session, I'm not going to mention the usual names, Elijah McCoy, Louis Latimer, Granville Woods, Charles Richard Drew, George Washington Carver, Lloyd Quarterman, Jan Ernst, Matt Sediger, Daniel Hale Williams, or Otis Boykin. It is important to give other scientists and inventors some shine. The earliest African Americans to contribute to scientific and technological endeavor were those who were held in bondage by European Americans. And there are five famous examples. Primus, a slave from Connecticut, helped his owner in surgery and in the general practice of medicine. When the doctor died, Primus took over his owner's practice. He was so successful throughout the country that even his former owner's white patients did not object to being treated by him. Second example, Papin, a Virginia slave, developed highly effective treatments against skin and venereal disease. 
His work was so outstanding that in 1729 the Virginia legislature, that's the Virginia government, bought him from his owner, thus freeing him from slavery to practice medicine exclusively. Third example, in 1733 another Virginia slave, we don't know his name, was freed by the state and given a pension for life following his discovery of cures for scurvy and distemper. Fourth example, 1772 a slave named Caesar had gained such a reputation for his use of roots and herbs to cure poisoning, even rattlesnake bites, that the state of North Carolina purchased his freedom and gave him a pension of $500 a year for life. According to the website www.measuringworth.com, $500 from that period is worth somewhere like $13,900 to $254,000 at 2010 prices. And our fifth example, in 1721, Onzimus described to his owner, Matha, the process of inoculation for the treatment of smallpox he received in Africa. Enthusiastically, Matha contacted 10 other doctors in Boston and told them about the practice of deliberately infecting healthy persons with smallpox as a way to make the body immune to a severe attack of smallpox. Now, James Durham, he lived between 1757 and 1802, is thought to have been the first black person to formally practice medicine in the United States. Like the others, he was born into captivity in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he was owned by several doctors. However, one of his enslavers, the physician Dr. Robert Love, encouraged him to go into medicine. By working as a nurse, he purchased his freedom. He opened a medical practice at the age of 26 and was annually taking earnings in excess of $3,000. According to the website www.measuringworth.com, this is between $71,700 and $233 million at 2010 prices. Durham became an expert in throat diseases and an expert in the relationship between climate and disease. Benjamin Banneker, 1731 to 1806, was easily the greatest of the early African-American scientists. He was a mathematician, an astronomer, a clockmaker, a surveyor, and an author. Unlike the vast majority of African-Americans at this time, he was born a free man. No one seems to be sure of how he achieved this status, and the various theories advanced by historians are all unsatisfactory. One theory is that he was one quarter white. That has since been discredited. He's thought to have been fully African, and so that theory, uh, people don't use it anymore. Whichever be the case, the young Banneker studied at a Quaker school where he excelled in mathematics. Initially, he became fascinated by timepieces, but at a later date, he became interested in astronomy. Since some writers claim a Dogon ancestry for Banneker's father, this interest in astronomy may possibly have some link to the young Banneker's alleged Dogon heritage. In 1753, Banneker designed and built a wooden clock inspired by a pocket watch that a merchant or trader had given to him. Before making the clock, Banneker read an old journal from London, which contained a picture of a clock. He also read a book on geometry and also Isaac Newton's classic Principia Mathematica, which is the premier text on physics. Banneker's completed clock kept good time striking on the hour, every hour, for 40 years. As an astronomer, his mathematical and astronomical knowledge led to his controversial prediction of a solar eclipse on the 14th of April, 1789. What was controversial was that Banneker's prediction was based on correcting errors he discovered in the works of published white astronomers and mathematicians, Ledbetter and Ferguson. Banneker wrote, It appears to me that the wisest men may at times be in error. For instance, Dr. Ferguson informs us that when the sun is in, within 12 degrees of either node at the time of full, the moon will be eclipsed. But I find that according to this method of projecting a lunar eclipse, there will be none by the above elements. 
and yet the Sun is within 11 degrees 46 minutes 11 seconds of the Moon's ascending node. But the Moon being in her apogee prevents the appearance of this eclipse. And the other example he found was errors that ought to be corrected in my astronomical tables are these. Second volume of Ledbetter, page 204. The equation, 3 degrees 30 minutes 4 seconds, ought to have been 3 degrees 28 minutes 41 seconds. So here Banneker has corrected both Ferguson and Ledbetter. In February 1791, Major Andrew Ellicott hired Banneker to assist him in the initial survey of the boundaries of the 100 square mile district that Maryland and Virginia would cede to the federal government of the United States. This district was to become the location of the soon to be built city of Washington. Banneker's activities consisted of making astronomical observations at Jones Point in Alexandria, Virginia to ascertain the location of the starting point of the survey. He also maintained the clock that he used to relate points on the surface of the Earth to the positions of the stars at specific times. Following this assignment, Banneker returned home to the village of Ellicott's Mill and set to work on more astronomical research. He wrote up his astronomical calculations in a series of almanacs that appeared in a number of editions. These documents contained his predicted solar and lunar eclipses and their subsequent revisions. They were printed and sold in six cities in four American states for the years 1792 through 1797. Other almanacs were produced up to the year 1802. He also kept a series of journals that contained his astronomical observations. His notebooks contained mathematical calculations and puzzles. I've got here the front cover of his 1792 almanac and ephemeris, and this is what it says on the front cover. The motions of the sun and moon, the true places and aspects of the planets, the rising and setting of the sun, and the rising, setting, and southing, place and age of the moon, etc. The lunations, conjunctions, eclipses, judgment of the weather, festivals, and other remarkable days, days for holding the Supreme and Circuit Courts of the United States, as also the usual courts in Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Now, by 1913, scholars estimate that African Americans held around 1,000 patents for various inventions in household goods, industrial machinery, transportation, electricity, and chemical compounds, including L.C. Bailery, inventor of a folding bed, patent number 629,286, received 18th of July, 1899. A.J. Beard, inventor of a car coupler, number 594,059, received 23rd of November, 1897. C.B. Brooks, inventor of a street sweeper, number 556,711, received 17th of March, 1896. J.A. Burr, inventor of a lawnmower, number 624,749, received 9th of May, 1899. L.S. Burridge, inventor of a typewriting machine, number 316,386, received 7th of April, 1895. R. A. Butler, inventor of a train alarm, number 584,540, received 15th of June 1897. W. S. Campbell, inventor of a self-setting animal trap, number 246,349, received 30th of August 1881. F. J. Farrell, inventor of a set of valves for steam engines, Number 428,671, received 25th of May, 1890. M. Hedden, inventor of a foot power hammer. Number 350,363, received 5th of October, 1886. J. Lee, inventor of a bread crumbling machine. Patent number 540,553, received 4th of June, 1895. T.J. Marshall, inventor of a fire extinguisher, 125,063, received 26th of May, 1872. 
Alexander Miles, inventor of an elevator, number 371,207, received 11th of October 1887. G. W. Murray, inventor of a fertilizer distributor, number 520,889, received 5th of June 1894. J. F. Pickering, inventor of an airship, number 643,975, received 20th of February 1900. W. P. Purvis, inventor of a paper bag machine, number 420,099, received 28th of January 1890. G. T. Sampson, inventor of a clothes dryer, number 476,416, received 7th of June 1896. J. Stannard, inventor of a refrigerator, number 455,891, received 14th of July 1891. <clears throat> J. R. Winters, inventor of a fire escape ladder, number 203,517, received 7th of May 1878. However, it is important to note that there is a difference between inventing a folding bed and inventing the folding bed. The prototypes for nearly all the non-electronic devices that we use today are to be found in the technology of the ancient civilizations, including black civilizations such as the ancient Egyptians. It is reasonable to conclude, therefore, that many devices have actually been invented many times before at a variety of different times in many different places around the world. Then there's other issues such as slavery. Most African Americans before 1865 were enslaved. This meant that they were legally unable to patent their discoveries since a patent was considered a contract between the United States government and the citizen. Enslaved Africans were not considered citizens of the United States and therefore could not own patents. In many such situations, their enslaver actually achieved the patent. So to document this, Robert Hayden, an authority whose research influenced a large part of this presentation, gave two examples of this. <clears throat> Joe Anderson, a slave on the plantation of Cyrus McCormick, is said to have made a major contribution to the McCormick grain harvester. Yet, he is only credited in the official records as being a handyman or helper to McCormick. Second example, in 1862, a slave owned by Jefferson Davis, the president, invented a propeller for ocean vessels. With a model of his invention, the slave showed remarkable mechanical skill in wood and metalworking. He was unable to get a patent on his propeller, but the merits of his invention were reported in many southern newspapers the propeller was finally used in ships of the Confederate Navy. This concludes the session. If you would like more information, consult the book Blacks and Science, Volume 3.